Right. <laughs> he got sideways with God at the last moment, right? <laughs> God had 40 years and he raised up Joshua. Praise God. So thank the Lord for that. So last week um, we had a kind of a revelation the Lord's been dealing with me on for sure, which is why does God allow suffering? And how does evil fit in God's plan? So we unpacked that last week. Kind of as a, the next step on this, I've titled the message, Through Jesus, Let Us Continually Offer to God a Sacrifice of Praise. That's Hebrews 13, 15. Through Jesus. I looked at King James, New Living, several trends. Through Christ, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. So the question I have for you this morning, I've asked myself this, this uh, when do you praise the Lord? All the time. All the, th now, the Holy Spirit's here. Now, maybe some of you do. Praise the Lord, and I need to have you come pray for me, all right? Um, there's this continual awareness. One of the words that came out in our New Year's Eve celebration one night for the king was sitting at his feet. And so there's this, well, let me ask it this way. When is it easy for you to praise the Lord? When everything's good, right? When you're in church on Sunday morning and the music's like, wow, and the coffee's good and you just had your donut, right? It's like, it's easy. And so in the scripture references here in the book of Hebrews, the really, if you think of the theme of the whole book of Hebrews, it'd be a really good book to read if you haven't read it recent. The dominant theme is hold fast to faith. And boy, if we ever needed that right now and what's coming, hold fast to faith in Christ. Despite persecution, suffering, evil, the stuff you're going through, the mess in family, circumstance, situation, boom, boom, you know, fill in the gap. There's this place of uh, hold fast in your faith. Because one of the things that we haven't seen anything yet, Jesus warned us what's coming, right? It's going to be really uh, rough. And one of my comments I get from folks is, well, you know, you're a pre-tribber, right? I said, I am. I'm out of here on the first train out of here. <laughs> He goes, well, I don't believe that. I said, okay, well, you get the next train. But, <laughs> but regardless of whether you're a pre-tribber, mid-tribber, post-tribber, the, the Lord says it's coming and it's going to be worse than anything that's ever happened in the earth, ever before or ever will be. That's why when Jesus said, will I find faith in the earth when I return? That's his second coming. So if and when we're here or the believers that come in through the trip... Will I find faith? Because faith gets tested in the persecution and trials. and That's when it's most difficult to worship the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but, man, I've had some spewing on phone calls and stuff over me lately from people that, you know, they're just, anyway. Um, and I wonder sometimes, but in John 15, 18, Jesus said this, why are you surprised when the world hates you? <laughs> Well, I, but I'm not trying to be hateful. It doesn't matter. You, if you carry the kingdom, guess what? Jesus said it happened to him, and you're going to be hated. In fact, they'll kill you and think they're doing God's work. Right? It's amazing. So we shouldn't be surprised when we stand right now. Christianity has never been in our, I don't believe in this nation ever, come under the persecution that we're facing right now. Incredible stuff, ungodliness that I never thought would be so rapidly promoted at some of the highest, these, there are people making decisions that are just absolutely bonkers. And so we need to stand and fight, keep up the good work, pray about this nation, but don't be surprised when you suffer. Um, why don't you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, and let's just kind of dive into that for a minute. In 1 Peter 4, This is a letter very close to when Peter is about to be martyred. 
He's going to be crucified upside down. The historians say it's the same day that the Apostle Paul was beheaded by Nero in Rome. He writes this letter as a precursor, and then his final letter, his prison letter, at age 65, Peter writes 2 Peter. And so Peter writes this. He knew that his time was coming. It had already been prophesied after he came back from uh, renouncing Jesus, or at least rejecting him. The Lord prophesies over him that one day they'll take you where you don't want to go, and they'll hold your hands, and he, that's why he was, I believe, crucified upside down. He said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord, so he was crucified upside down, history tells us. He says in verse, let's look at 1 Peter 4, beginning in verse 12, dear friends, don't be surprised. At what? At the fiery trials you're going through. As if something strange were happening to you. Anybody have any strange fires going through right now or struggles and battles? And Wow. Instead, be very glad. Oh, man. Be very glad for the fiery trials that you're going through. For these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to the whole world. So be happy when you're insulted for being a Christian. For the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, prying into other people's affairs, but it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name, the Christ ones. For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? Also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to the godless sinners? So if you're suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. So as a precursor to this message, understanding that it's just part of the, the turf that we're part of. When we became Christians and our names were written in the Lamb's book, so let's look at one more Scripture here. Turn with me to Psalm 34 in verse 1. Those who worship the Lord continually will love this one as well. Psalm 34, 1. David writes this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. New Living says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. So continually praising the Lord. What's in your mouth? Praises. James does a good job of when you don't have praises in your mouth. Right? James 3 says, those who control their tongue are actually spiritual. Those who don't. So you don't need to answer this one. Do you always have good praises coming out of your mouth? Okay, you answered it. Me either. Um, so he tells us we're supposed to continue. So I, just, I was meditating on this last night, and then the commercial, the Capital One commercial came up. So what's in your wallet? And I'm like, so what's in your mouth? <laughs> and so it would be really good for us to ask the Lord for spiritual self-control um, yeah, I got convicted this morning. I was telling my, my wife, I said, we had the grandbaby, we had a birthday party for Elijah Yes, he turned 11, and it was just, we had everybody in. My grandson-in-law got a surprise leave from Korea, and he came back and surprised everybody, and so he was here for a month, and then he's headed back to Korea. So it was just really this awesome time. Mom was out of COVID, we just, birthday cake, and you know, and it was like, Oh, I'm tired. Then she said, the two boys want to sleep over, Gabriel and Elijah. And I said, oh, oh okay, yeah, I, yeah. 
But I have this routine. You know, I, I get up early Sunday mornings, and I, I've spent about probably six or seven hours already on the sermon, but I like to get before the Lord really. Well, they're up playing basketball. I'm not kidding. The sun was not even up yet. And they're out there shooting baskets in the front. And then, you know, anyway. I said to my wife, I said, honey, it's probably not a great idea to have the kids sleep over on a Saturday night. And then the Lord got me convicted. He said, no, no. I'm so much of a Martha sometimes. You know, it's like, my wife is such a wonderful Mary. She's going to sit at the feet and just capture the moments. You know, I just need to learn more of that. And, and so I apologized. I said, you know what? We can have them sleep over if they, not every Saturday, but, but, <laughs> woo -hoo. So I didn't have the continual praises in my mouth. Do you forgive me, honey? Of, yeah, I have to. She says, I got to. I have to. It's in the book, you know. <laughs> okay. I know. Praise the living God. Okay. Moving right along. Last week, let me see if, if uh, or kind of bring us into this place. I think it's really more difficult to offer continual praises to God if we don't really, really have a deep revelation of how good he is. Right? And so I tried to cover this last week. Remember that we looked at free will. There's really two boundary marks on this, right? You have to look at free will was given both to humans and to angels. And we see the consequences of making a wrong choice. One third of the angels are thrown out of heaven. They're part, I believe that's the de demonic realms that are here. Revelation 12. They were thrown out of heaven down to earth. And so we also know that free will, you know what happened in the garden. So human choices, and then we know that Jesus had a choice as well in the garden. When he, when he actually sweated blood, I don't know how... There's a term for that. I don't remember the name of it. When you are so under such pressure of anxiety, you actually, the pores open. Um, I think I saw it at one point when my wife was delivering our 10-pound child. The blood vessels were broken. And so there's this place where Jesus even had a choice. Remember three times he asked the Father, can we do it a different way? And then he surrendered. He said, it might, not my will. So there's something about free will, but then understanding who's in charge and who's in control. And we unpacked this, I think, at great length last week. That we know that God is in charge. The universe is in his hands. It runs better than a Swiss watch, Amen. right? But he's given dominion. In fact, Daniel read it in Psalm 8 this morning. You have been given dominion and control over this area and your life. Now, there's a moment when God says, no, sovereignty, you can do whatever you want, but I'm now acting. In his first time coming, he interceded at that moment. And he's coming back a second time, and I don't care what you're doing on that day, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he's Lord whether you like it or not. So there's this place where he's, he's as large and in charge, but you have control, and then we get mad at God. So once we unpack this and realize, you know, I sleep around and then I wonder why I got pregnant or I have some kind of an aerial disease, and then you get mad at God and blame him. Why'd you let this happen to me? Right? Or you go out and you get drunk, and then you get a DWI, or you wreck your car, and say, God could have intervened. Well, he told you in the book, don't be drunk. <laughs> right? So when we start looking at who's in charge and who's in control and free will, we start to realize, stop blaming God. It was never his plan, but we also said, without free will, without free choice, there is really no love. They call it another thing when it's forced love, Right? So then we looked also about, there are three, what I consider, conditions or premises of why evil comes in the earth, and they're based upon both free will choices, but the source or the origin of that, is, number one, is your sin. If you commit sin, when you violate the book, and then you wonder why you have some form of punishment or consequence, and then we get mad at God, why did he let me have this happen, you know? No, your sin... That's why he told Joshua, Joshua 1.8, meditate on this word day and night, apply it to your life, and you will be successful in everything you do. Boy, that's a word for somebody and me, right? So number one, my own sin, but then the sin of others, going on with the conditionality of the person who dr drives drunk and kills an innocent, and then the parents or the family of the innocent wonder why God let this happen, because the free will choice of the person who drunk and got behind the wheel caused that pain. But then we get mad at God. When he, 
in order to operate in the freedom of choice and love because perfect love expels all the fears. And then the third condition is the devil and his demons. They come and they've come to kill, steal, and destroy, John 10.10. 10. So we have to understand this in order to be able to offer him the sacrifice of praise. If you will settle in your heart, God is always good. Just whether you got it here or here, just get it there and recognize God, there's a lot I don't understand that I would not have done it this way, but that's where Isaiah 55, your ways are not my ways. Then I wonder sometimes, I pray certain things, and then when things start to happen, not that way, God. You can't do it that way. <laughs> you pray, and he does things sometimes in ways that are never been our choice. So if you look at your outline, and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13, it's a very interesting chapter, this whole chapter 13. It's, you know, if chapter 11 is the whole faith chapter. It's the hall of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then it lists all these hallmark, right, in the chapters there, chapter 11 and 12. Just amazing he warns us in chapter 12, 1, you know, be careful of the sin that so easily besets us. But we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, 3. Jesus, the author and finisher. But then he goes to chapter 13 in his conclusions. And it's very interesting, the listing that's here and the, the exhortation. But look at verse 15. Therefore, I like when Lisa says, the therefore is therefore because of something that was there before, right? And so when you look at all of what he's saying at this moment, he says, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. King James says, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. New Living says, therefore, let us offer, see, it's, it's a choice, it's an offering, it's a free will, through Jesus continually, the sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. Do you have an allegiance to the name? And don't forget to do good and share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that pleases God. So look at your outline, and I've tried to kind of unpack my own transparency here when I've struggled to praise him. We have a choice every day, this top paragraph, in life, we can choose to live absorbed in worry and stress, on fast track of busy. I got the t shirt on that. Focused only on what surrounds us and tuned into the roar of the world. Or we can ask God to help us take our eyes off of that, all the swirling around, the problems, the mess, and the voices of others. Remember, about three, four weeks ago, I, I unpacked this thing about fix your thoughts. And we looked at the four origins of the thoughts that come into your, your mind. We, uh, we unpacked that in great detail. But there are four, first of all, between 50 and 75,000 thoughts come into your brain every day. They've measured that. And over 75% of them are negative. So if you're not careful about what you're getting in your head, and if you think everything that comes into your head is from you, you're not biblically sound. It's not true. So the four voices that come, the, we've unpacked this. You can go back a few weeks and look at it. Fix your thoughts and guard your heart. Fix your thought. Philippians 4, 8, right? It says, fix your thoughts on what is right, true, honorable, holy, and pure. And he goes on and says, think of those things. And if you do that, he'll put a guard over your heart and your mind that you can't understand. It's, it supernaturally surpasses human understanding. So there's something Paul knew about that. He told us, he also told us, take every thought captive, right? 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, take every thought captive, everything that raises itself above the knowledge of Christ, capture that thing if it doesn't agree with Christ. Well, how do you know what agrees with Christ? It's in the book, and the Holy Spirit, who is your teacher, your trainer, your equipper, your comforter, the powerhouse, ask him, Philippians, uh, James 1, 5. If you lack wisdom, ask God. Is that you, God? No. So the four origins of thought is, one, the demonic realm. 
you're a loser, you'll never amount to anything, nobody loves you, you ought to be so ashamed. You know right away that thought, where that joker comes from. Then there's the world. The world says, feels good, do it. Want to get drunk Friday night? Yeah, come on, let's go, right? The world will tell you. They'll tell you all sorts of crazy things. They'll even legalize it. All right? So the world is a mess because it's under the control of the God of this world, Corinthians tells us, who is Satan. The third one, so you got the demonic realm, you got the world, and your heart. If your heart's broken or it's been messed with, like all of our hearts with in life, and you've been told certain things that, or things have happened to you that are true, but it's not the truth. They truly happen, but it is not the truth. So once you recognize that that's happened to me, you're not going to deny what happened, but that's not the truth of what God says. That's why what's happening on Wednesday night, Bishop said it now and Loretta said it. If you're not here Wednesday night, you are really missing a revelation of love on your heart. I'm, we, we've done five of them. We've got seven more. But this revelation that Leif's bringing, I've been with Leif in, in missions overseas, and he's been here. He's a brother. Man, he's awesome. But he's had this revelation of the love of God that is so rich. And so I was, I was greatly moved Wednesday night. And we can't live stream it. The church spent $1,000 to buy this. He spent years developing all of this. And so I just want to encourage you to come out if you can, because there's something about the revelation of that. So the world, the demons, your heart, your heart can be broken and it's being fixed if you let God change the way you think about that. And then the fourth one is the Holy Spirit. And if you'll run your thoughts through the Holy Spirit filter and recognize if you know the word, that doesn't line up. Chuck that. I don't have to be guilted, ashamed, or afraid. Okay. So we want to make sure we sort out the voices because there's a lot of voices out there and they are getting more and more deception. In fact, Jesus warned the deception would be so deep during this time. Look at what Paul writes to Timothy. In the last days, they will give to seducing spirits and, and doctrines of demons. It's loosed in the earth. I can't believe some of the things I am hearing. Like, I know they're, they're, that's demonic. That is totally demonic what's, what's being done right now. When this administration wants to go push the LGDPQ, whatever it is, um, agenda worldwide now, they just introduced a bill this week to bring your tax dollars to other nations to bring that about. It's just like what they're doing in the abortion rules. It is, I don't know how long God can bless this nation. I really am concerned. And so... We need to be very careful about what is going on right now and stand our ground and believe what God said he would do. So let's keep going. So listen, watch out for the voices. We can look up to him, top paragraph here. The one who holds it all together, it holds it in his hands. God desires our whole heart and he waits for us to return if we've drifted away. There have been times in my life when I worked for General Electric for 25, man, I, I drifted away. Pastor Willie said, man, when I got saved, I was on Man, praise God, I wish, you know, all over the place. And finally, oh, wow. And then the Lord gave me the opportunity to call me, and I came in a way that I'm still growing. But I just, uh, this place where if I suffice to praise. Look at number one there. Praise is joy from a grateful heart. In the spirit realm, sacrifice and praise are actually all intertwined and connected. Praise does not always cost you something. We praise our dog for fetching the ball. People do a job well done. Praise is often in response to some action that directly benefits us. We find it often easy to praise God when, with the same motivation. When he's blessed us, helped us, protected us, we sing, worship, talk how good God is. We can see it. That kind of praise, though it's worthwhile, does not cost us anything. It's not a sacrifice. There are those times when God did not come through the way we thought he should or would. The medical test comes back positive. The spouse wants a divorce. A child is wayward. The mortgage company calls a loan. God seems really far away, and the praise is the last thing that wants to bubble up out of your heart. We can't see his goodness, and circumstance scream that he's forgotten us. Ever been there? 
I have. To praise God in those times requires personal sacrifice. It takes an act of the will to lay all of you on the altar before God when we don't even understand. When we bring a sacrifice of praise, we choose to believe that even through life, is, even though life is not going the way we think it should, God is still good and he can be trusted. When we choose to praise him in spite of the storms, he is honored and our faith grows deeper. Number six, the command in Hebrews 13, 15 says the sacrifice is offered continually of praise to God, not based on our opinion of his job performance. Ever been there? Judged God? I have. Praise cannot be treated as a reward we give God for his obvious blessings. Isaiah 29, 13 says, these people come near me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Real praise continues regardless of the circumstances. It flows continually from a worshiping heart in good times and in bad. Let's, you know this scripture, I think. Let's let's turn to Acts 16 for a moment. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas. Now, I've been on mission trips, and (laughs) I remember being in Tanzania, and the bus was two hours late, and we had to go like hours to get to Nairobi, to Kenya, to get out and look like we missed our plane. And man, the fruit of the Spirit was all gone from me. <laughs> and when that bus driver got there, I let him know. <laughs> it was not a good testimony. Hallelujah. Pray for me. I something, my wife says she does. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. So there's, there are times. Now, we made it. You know, it was amazing. God, you know, did it all, and I had to repent, and I did. And... <sighs> Real praise continues regardless. So let's look at this. I don't know if I were Paul or Silas. You're on a mission trip. You've been called by God. He told you to come here, do it this way. He gets there. He's in God's plan. And you know what happens. Paul and Silas. Verse 16, one day as they were going out, this is Acts 16, 16. One day as they were going down to the place of prayer, they met a demon-possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned a lot of money for her masters. She followed Paul and the rest of them, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. The devil's telling the truth. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? The devil can tell the truth sometimes, right? Even though it's inspired by darkness and a plan that's different. Well, anyway, I've had the devil lie to me because he's a liar. Verse 18, they went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated, he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. Instantly it left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas, dragged them before the authorities in the marketplace. The whole city was in an uproar because of these Jews. They shouted to the city officials, They're teaching customs that are illegal for the Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas. The city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with rods. They were severely beaten, and they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them in the inner dungeon, clamped their feet in stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, And the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake. A massive earthquake. Does God ever surprise you with suddenlies? Especially when you do things that, man, it makes no sense to be doing this. You ought to be crying and you're singing praises. (laughs) Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake and the prisons were shaken to the foundation. All the doors immediately flew open. The chains of every prisoner fell off. See, this is the collateral blessing. Nobody dies in the earthquake. This is a God earthquake, right? There are God earthquakes, right? Praise the Lord. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open, assumed the prisoners had escaped, drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted, stop, don't kill yourself. We're all here. I mean, the other prisoners didn't run off either. Something in the atmosphere. Come on, if you're a prisoner and your stocks fall, wouldn't you take off for the hills? You think? No. 
They were drawn to the captivity of the presence, and they all knew. They all knew what happened. There's something bigger here than even our escaping to freedom. The real freedom is here. What did they do? The jailer called out, got lights, and ran to the dungeon, fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Shoot. He went from, I know the Romans are going to kill me too. It doesn't matter. Right now, <laughs> what do I need to do? And with everyone in his household, here's the collateral blessing again. They shared the word of the Lord with them, with him, and all who lived in his household. Even at the hour of the night, the jailer cared for them, washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. Boy, what a night. Amen. Like Leif said, do you want what goes before that? It's the stuff that, you know, I want your anointing. Are you willing to go through what I went to get the anointing? Uh, uh, mm. But we just read, remember, it's a joy to suffer fiery trials. Be always glad, First Peter. <laughs> okay. Verse 35, the next morning the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let the men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials said, you, you and Silas are free to go in peace. But Paul replied, this is cute, I love this. They have publicly beaten us without a trial and put us in prison, and we're Roman citizens. You can't do that. You're not supposed to be able to do that in the U.S. either. It used to be so. So now they want us to leave secretly. Certainly not. Let them come themselves and release us. I'm going to eat a little crow here. When the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail, apologized to them, brought them out, and begged them to leave the city. When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned home to Lydia. There they met the believers, encouraged them once more. They left the town. So we see this amazing thing. What happens in the midst of an offered sacrifice of praise? So let's, let's unpack some of this. Number seven, the sacrifice of praise comes from a humble heart that has been purified by fire. It rises from a spirit that has chosen to honor God in spite of the pain. In fact, in spite of the pain. What does that do to the devil? He's done his best, and you're sitting there beaten and bruised and brokenhearted, and it looks like everything's, praise your name. Man, what does he do with it? See, the eyes of the Lord, he says, the eyes of the Lord look to and fro in the earth to find someone he can show himself strong in. That kind of sacrifice, that kind of praise says, look at my son, look at my daughter. You get down there and you help them right now. He releases charge over us, right? He expresses, and it goes on, it says, you do not delight in sacrifice. Now, here's an interesting twist. You do not delight in sacrifice, or in, he's talking about the Old Testament sacrifice, where you, or you come and you write your checks. He's not talking about that now. It's good to do those things. It's, it, was com, it was commended in the Old Testament and the New. It says, but I don't delight in that kind of a sacrifice, or I'd bring it. I don't take pleasure in the burnt offerings. This is bringing all of those sacrifices of the Old Testament. My sacrifice, O oh God, this is David, is a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. God will not despise that. Turn the page. Hindrances. So these are, these are some of the things that I see that have hindered my past. Suffering is probably one that's difficult, even though the fiery trials were supposed to. It says, not a day passes when we don't face suffering, loss, or grief in one way or another. Suffering follows us because we're people broken by sin, living in a broken world. In my experience, suffering, loss, and grief have been very effective in blocking my ability to desire to praise God. In these times, the burden of offering such a sacrifice seems impossible, and I know that I'm not alone. Habakkuk writes this, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Walking through death, disease, miscarriages, infertility, tragedy and is a common theme in the fall of man, inescapable. And Habakkuk's words at one time or another probably have taken up residence in my heart, stripping me of the ability to desire and praise God. 
but it's also that moment when we're really humble before God. You see the psalmist through. You, we, we're, I would encourage you, look at a psalm. Look at all of them. You see, it's just beautiful how they cry out, where are you, God, and you've left me. And Boy, David's got some wild ones in there. Number two, hindrance, abundance. However, praise doesn't only disappear from my heart and vocabulary in suffering times. Abundance can have the same result. When it seems like I have it all together, I can't neglect I can neglect praise. When suffering isn't my companion and fear doesn't plague me, I dethrone God from its rightful, his rightful place. I rest comfortably, comfortably in ease of his blessings that I imagine are of my making. You ever get to that place? Look what I've done. And we're not too far from what sometimes what the devil did and right in Isaiah 27. I will, I will, I did, I, 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 I. There's no I in this. If you realize every good gift comes down from the Father of lights, that's why I love it. Bill Johnson says this way. He says, when I get heaped praise on me, because, you know, he says, as soon as I get quiet with God, God, I know it's you, right? That's a really good practice. Recognize if you think you're all this in a bag of chips, you're not, right? He tells, in fact, if you, <laughs> be careful. So not that he doesn't love you. He does, right? He loves you unconditionally. But we have to recognize what he is. So when we dethrone God, I'm carrying, when I'm carrying on this legacy of the forgetful Israelites whom Moses warned, take care, Deuteronomy 6.12, take care that you don't forget your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. Third one that hinders praise, when life seems mundane. There are stretches between suffering and abundance when the days are just routine, regular, the rhythm of life kind of lulls us to sleep. There's no praise because there's no abundance. There's no praise because the noisy background routine of life. I neglect my primary call. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And the admonition from Psalm 46, be still and know I'm God. So what do we do? We recognize that. And the discipline, oftentimes when I talk to people, um, when they come in, and usually it's because there's a need, um, battle or something, and you ask them, so are you in the Word? Are you and your spouse, your family, loved ones, are you in the Word? Are you regularly praying? Well, no, or not that much, or we used to. And then, you know, the Word of God is full of living power. Hebrews 4.12 is able to cut between soul and spirit. So this is these disciplines that will help us in offering the prayer. If we're stayed connected even in those times of mundane or abundance or suffering. And why is Jesus worthy of the, of the sacrifice? Well, wow, we know. So what, let's look at some of the results of sacrifice of praise. This is amazing. Bottom of that page there, it says, one, when you start to offer the sacrifice of praise, it'll dethrone your pride and your pity. You no longer become a victim. Number one, Get your focus off of me, 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 I, 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 and it gets your focus on the one who deserves all the praise. I'm telling you, that'll work. I promise you. If you'll try it, and even, well, I don't have anything I can thank the Lord for. Well, start basic. When I get in that place, what I just, okay, I woke up and the coffee's hot. The power's on. I got a roof, right? Start, you, pretty soon you start realizing I've been in places, there's none of that. In fact, 90-something, 5% of the American population has that where the rest of the world might not. So you can find something to focus your attention there. Number two, it leads to a deeper place of humility. When, when we says in James 4, it says, humble yourself before God, draw close to him, he'll draw close to you, then you can resist the devil and he'll flee. Humility, remember, he's, he, can't, he, he, he hates the stench of pride. If you cannot humble yourself before your wife, your boss, your co-workers, your congregation, if you can't do that, you got a problem. And it's called pride and arrogance. Because if I didn't listen to this woman, I'd be in big trouble. There's times, now she didn't have it all right, but I, when I started out, man, it was like, no, I, I got the answer. And then I realized, duh, fall on my face. She said, I told you. And so I'm 
There's a reason he puts us together with other believers who can sharpen us. So if you're not part of the congregation, you're not in your men's group, you're not in a woman, you're not in the Word, you are in a terrible discipline. This, there's a place where you're just in a, in a bad place. And so I would encourage you to humble yourself and let others tell you what they see. Because if you know that God loves you, you're not going to get all... The people who... Re, who react the most to corrective discipline are the ones that are most insecure. When Jesus was before Pilate and he didn't open his mouth, Pilate says, don't you know what I can? He said, you don't know what authority you have. Jesus was not insecure. He was not, even when the devil tried to make him insecure. What Leif shared on Wednesday night, you hear the voice of the father, just as Jesus is baptized in the war. He's 30 years old, had not begun ministry yet, goes to John. He's a sinless guy, the sinless God man. And John says, oh, no, no, I, I can't do it. He must be John. The father says the heavens were torn open and the, the dove descended, the Holy Spirit descended on him. He hears the audible voice. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. That moment he comes out, he's tempted, goes into the devil, goes into the desert, de tempted by the devil. The first word the devil says to him is, if you're the son of God. After you fasted 30 days, why don't you change these stones to bread so you can eat? You see, he's such a dog. He's such a snake, right? So Jesus had just gotten the father's affirmation. This is my son. What do you mean, if? This devil, what are you talking? Get behind me. Right? Once we get a reality revelation, that's why this, this, this teaching is so, you know, we... We pray about what God brings on Sunday mornings and Wednesdays. So if you're not present or you're not connected, you are missing it. Yeah. <sighs> because God is preparing this body for a purpose for what he's going to do. But if you're not on the board, if you're not in it, you miss it. And so, I'm, and it's not a religious thing. I know this, you're all busy. I get it. And having been there, I get it. Four kids and working, you know, 16 hour days. I get it. But the truth is, there is this revelation. If you get it, and you have this place of deeper humility, you realize he's in charge. Number three, opens a revelation of his presence. He inhabits the praise of his people. Why is it so easy on Sunday mornings when the worship team who's prepared, you know how much blood, sweat, and tears these worship leaders go into? Man, they, the practice, the hours, the preparation. And it's like, and they bring these songs. They work hard at it. Because they want to bring a good song set to the Lord. But they prayed about the song set. And it's so easy. It's like, oh, you come in. Even if you, got a, you had a hard week, it's like, oh. Because something happens when he inhabits the praise of his people. That's why if you don't praise him at home, your house doesn't have the inhabitation. Number four, or number four enters gates, right? Number three, part two. Of three there, it says, oh, he enters his gates. So if you want to praise him, the door's open, the gate's open, and you get before the king. And that's when that happens, the devil's got to go. Number four, praise worship will make the enemy flee. You're real familiar. We won't turn, we won't, we won't turn there, but praise is my weapon. We sing that song, right? Praise is a weapon. It's true. If you want a scripture, Second Chronicles 20, 22. Remember with Jehoshaphat? All the ites were coming again. Wars declared by the Zebusites, the Mennonites, blah, blah, and all the termites were coming, right? And so he's got this place. They're all coming. What does he do? He declares a fast, gets all the people before him, and a prophetic word comes out. It says, tomorrow, send the worshipers out front. How'd you like to be that worship team? The, it says the king selected the worshipers for that day. How'd you like to be... We're going out there in front of all the ites. Yeah, there'd be some of our worship. I know they'd raise their hand. Put me out there. I'll go. But I'd be like, uh, mm, wow, yeah. You mean the warriors with all their skills are going to stay behind, and you're going to put the instrumentalists and the singers out front? Yeah, that's what God said. God said it. Can you imagine being, I don't know, maybe the word, God said it? Wow. That night, can you imagine? I wonder if they slept, the worship teams. They probably were practicing their chords like, this better really sound good. <laughs> I don't know. I just, my mind goes crazy. But, but it says he put the worshipers out front, and the moment they started singing, God caused the enemy to kill each other. Come on. 
Man. So something happened. And that's why. Was that a sacrifice of praise? We could die today. But you know what? We've decided the word of God is true. And if our king missed it and he selected me, if I die today, I die in his grace. They said, you know what? My love of him, I will not deny him, right? And so, woo Man, so they go out there, and then he just destroys all the termites. Amazing what he does. Number five, praise and worship opens the door to the supernatural miracles. Man, when you know that one, it's like Paul and Silas in prison. What if they just like, God, we were here, and we had your word, and we thought we heard you to do this mission trip, and we shared the word, and we cast out the demons, and now we're beaten. They didn't do any of that. They started singing, and God caused the earthquake that saved the whole household. Come on. This God is an amazing God. Woo, glory to God. Well, if I could have Ron and, and Paul, maybe you guys move the communion table over. I want to close the service today with, with communion, and I'd like you to uh, really search your heart. You, you can't come into a service often like this and with so much worship and recognizing that there's, there's gaps, right? The, the Holy Spirit puts his finger on areas because he loves us. He's the teacher. He's the encourager. He calls us alongside. and So let's just close our eyes for a moment. And Paul tells us in, in 1 Corinthians 11 to judge ourselves. We also know that this is the meal that heals. Katie had some words of knowledge. I told her before communion, why don't you share those? Because I believe this morning as we, I remember a few years ago, we had a, a Buddhist who came and he was not a believer. God saved that morning, and when he took the host, the demons left him. He says, man, I got, I said, well, yes, the meal that heals you. And so I believe that the Lord can do healing in such an amazing way. So Katie had some words that you want to release. Um, I felt like um, that today um, God was going to um Heal stomach issues, and I got a certain name, but the Lord knows who it is, and, um, and I felt like that there's um, some people that need to just forgive themselves, and the other word is that I got that if you take communion and you um, ask the Lord to give you a new heart, he will give you a new heart, and, wow. and God wants to deliver people from anger and bitterness. You also told me that some of the stomach issues were related to... Anger and bitterness. Anger and bitterness. Self-hatred. Self-hatred. She was praying this morning for the day, and she said, Dad, I got this. So, so we want to just open this up. Lord, we know that when we become one... John 17, Jesus encouraged us to become one with him and the Father. There's this continuum of the oneness that he promised. And then he finishes John 17 with a promise that I will continue to reveal myself to them. And he promised that these disciples that you had given me, their testimony would bring in all those <clears throat> after him. And that's you and me. In Hebrews, <clears throat> excuse me, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that he has done. He has entered that greater and more perfect tabernacle in the heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of the created world. With his blood, not the blood of goats or calves, he entered the most holy place 
once and for all time. And he secured our redemption. The revelation of the communion table where he said, do this in remembrance of me. This is the tabernacle that is in heaven. That when you engage in this, you're actually in the throne room presence. You're in the tabernacle presence. And so I want us to see this in our hearts as we confess our sins. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if you confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive you from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. So think of the, well, don't think of it. <laughs> Something that you've ever done in the past that just you know, kind of messes with you. If you've confessed that, it's as far as the east is from the west. It's no longer recorded in heaven. So Lord, I thank you that on the night of the betrayal, you took the bread and you broke it. And you said, I want you to take this. I want you to eat it. It should become one with you, become part of you. Then I want you to take the cup that you may not understand right now, the night of the, the before the crucifixion, but I'm going to take a cup that will seal this in my blood. This new covenant that Hebrews speaks of is a greater covenant where the old has become obsolete and the new covenant has replaced this in my blood. And so, Lord, we thank you that the blood of Jesus seals this. So, Lord, I thank you that we come before you confessing our sin and recognizing that you're the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no other way to the Father except through you. John 14. And the men selected this song, Gratitude, and it's such, he played it at men's group Monday night. It's such an awesome song of gratitude towards the Lord. So if you'll come, form two lines down the center. We, you can break off, and, and if you have any physical challenges and you want to come behind the, the communion table, that would work as well. Move this up just a tad.
fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah So come on my soul don't you get shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those arms so get up and praise the lord i said come on my soul don't you get shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a lion in Side of your tongues, so get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me? Lift up your song, cause you got a light inside of your tongues, so get up and praise the Lord. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you got a lion inside of those tongues So get up and praise the Lord Oh, come on my soul Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you got a lion inside so get up and praise the Lord. Don't you get shy on me, lift up 